Good day, metric learners of South Africa. Today we are going through genetic diseases and genetic counseling and how important it is to respect people and also to consider the issues that they have and the challenges that they have. So this is quite a value-driven um, part of the syllabus, but it's also very important because very often your questions are based on diseases that are genetic diseases. They passed on via hereditary traits and people, you've got to consider it. You've got to look at it very carefully and be humane. So here we go. Genetics and related genetic diseases. Right, first of all, genetic disorders, that is a condition that where a person inherits, uh, inherits diseases and traits from the parents. Okay, now they, those genes may be recessive genes passed on through many generations and only come through in an offspring five or six generations later. Those little recessive traits sit there and they sit there till eventually there are two of them and they come through. All right, so genetic disorders are a condition that is inherited from one or both parents, and my pen is not here, from one or both parents, all right, and results from mutations in genes on chromosomes. Please remember, any mutation, if it is a good mutation, um, it, it can then be passed on to the next generation. But sometimes, if that mutation ends up being, or that trait, ends up being a, because of a recessive gene, that recessive gene is masked by dominant genes. So it can go along for a very long time without actually causing any impact. But when conditions change and the environment changes, maybe that recessive gene ends up being or providing or giving the person a trait that helps them to survive. And then the organism will survive and the trait will be passed on. Human genome, please know that the genome is our genetic makeup as a human being. So when we talk about the Human Genome Project, which is something they could give you in an exam, scientists here, what they do is they locate faulty genes. Now, there's a lot of debate about this because they say at the end of the day, they can take two parents' gene, gene sets or their genomes and they can see, well, there's a little problem here and this gene is not right and they just remove these genes and you can quite literally um, get to a point where we give them a recipe and say, well, my spouse and I, my partner and I, we want to have a baby and we want this baby to be a basketball player. So he, it must be a boy and he must be six foot eight tall and he must have this physique and he must have what, 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 uh, good ball skills, etc. And you almost write this recipe for a child. Now that is taking it sort of to the extreme and to the ridiculous, but it is becoming possible. Where the advantage is though, is if they look at the human genome and they can take the DNA issues and they can change genes and alter genes for cancer, for Huntington's disease, and they take them out, um, or chronic heart disease, they can take all of that out. That would be the good part of it. But as we know, human beings tend to always go over the top, and we tend to sort of abuse situations, and then we have a bit of a problem. All right, genetic disorders may be seen at birth, or they may develop later, like for example, the Huntington Correa. Now, if we look at um, the single gene mutations, they're responsible for more than, please people look at this. Now, this is not something you need to learn off by heart, but it's something very impressive if you're sitting with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you say, oh, did you know that single gene mutations make up for almost 3,900 genetic diseases? They're responsible for 3,900 genetic diseases, and it's one single gene mutation. That is a lot. That little tiny thing can cause so much issues. All right, then we have mutations may be fatal, um, very important. They result in genetic diseases, and others may be quite harmless. Now, if they are harmless, that's fine. And then if the circumstances change, as I said earlier, or the environmental conditions change, maybe that harmless mutation ends up destroying the organism or it may enhance that organism's chances of survival. Mutations occur spontaneously, so um, unless they are, if we have genetic modifications, naturally they are spontaneous. 
instantaneous. So it's when there's a little bit of a change during meiosis and that crossing over during the meiosis process, that could cause it. Or it could just be in the gene replication. All right, then, when an individual is born, the genes are, are, um, are, that later cause disease, the individual has a predisposition. Now, people, you need to know this word. And for our learners that are second and third and fourth, English is, is your second, third and fourth language. Predisposition, pre means before, and a disposition. Dis is always not really good if you disappoint somebody. So dis sort of slightly negative and position so it's a predisposition means that you have a chance of ending up with this disease um, to the diseases like breast cancer diabetes coronary heart disease um, those are all things that are passed down genetically now factors that cause gene mutations um, and these are not written in stone they are not the only causes there are thousands of causes but you are in grade 12 you are not doing your master's doctorates on genetics so there you would be expected to know a couple of hundred um, here we are only looking at a few and these really are logical if we look at the internal changes in a nucleus this would be important in other words something goes wrong within that nucleus um, because of of just the process of mitosis or the process of meiosis remember when something happens during the process of my, uh, mitosis in other words for growth repair and replacement um, that is when we end, could end up with a benign growth or tumor um, that's just a whole bunch of cells that now start replicating at a rapid rate because they're trying to fix themselves they realize oops um, there was a problem here, but what happens is those same cells will now undergo mitosis at a faster rate and that's what causes a benign growth, which we can really cut out quite happily. Um, but if there are any internal changes in that nucleus, it immediately impacts on the DNA. And what does the DNA carry? It carries our genes and our hereditary information. So if that is changed and the gene combinations are changed and our nitrogenous basis combinations are changed, that is when we have a big problem. Unhealthy diet and alcohol. Now people, if you are an alcoholic and you are destroying your liver because it's your liver's job to clean your body out and to get those toxins out. Now, if, if you putting a lot of pressure on, on your liver because you're an alcoholic. Well, hello, think about it. If you end up with, with, with total degeneration of your liver or cancer of the liver, um, you caused it to yourself. You, through, through not eating properly, through having an unhealthy diet, through um, having too much alcohol, you're doing this to your body don't because those it's one of the factors that's going to cause gene mutations environment now in the environment we have toxic paints we have asbestos um, we have all kinds of things that are within our environment and go and research it have a look at it you'll find if the textbooks you're using um, also go to the media center um, get onto the internet go to an internet cafe and if you don't know how to use a, uh, the internet ask someone to help you because it is the most amazing source of information. Um, but have a look at all the different things in the environment that can actually cause gene mutations. Very, very important for you to know as background knowledge when they give you questions that refer to gene mutations and what environmental factors would cause gene mutations. Um, then we have nuclear radiation. I mean, we all know this one. If you go to the dentist and they're going to take x-rays of your mouth, which every dentist seems to do and then charge you for, they put that metal sort of heavy cloak thing over you um, when they are x-raying your mouth. Why? Because of radiation. And they also leave the room. Because remember, they do lots of x-rays because that's lots of money. So nuclear radiation, we have ultraviolet radiation. Um, if you think of ultraviolet radiation to a lesser extent, it causes skin cancer. Um, people in Australia where there seems to be quite a large hole over the, in the ozone over them, um, we don't get impacted as much, but they do. Um, there it is illegal for a child to swim without having 
those little swimsuits that go to here, we've gone back to the 1920s, those swimsuits from the 1920s where the children's knees and legs are covered and their arms are covered and they must, they may not go into the playgrounds without a hat on. Now that's just a little bit of extra information there to make you think. And this is what they're going to do in this section. They're going to make you think. They're going to expect you to use your information and your morals and your values and what is accepted within society and how the processes occur. So your ultraviolet radiation and then x-rays. Um, and then of course your viruses. Uh, let's have a think, a little tiny virus, very pretty little virus, but a very nasty piece of work like the HI virus. So what does it do? It gets in and it does its thing and it plays around with you and you actually feel nothing and then all of a sudden says, hello baby, and it's destroyed all your immune system. So these are the kind of things. So your viruses, they can and will change. Um, our TB virus, um, or, or, or a TB at the moment, is a combination of a virus and a bacteria. And it is a horrible little organism but a very clever organism, because remember, what does it want to do? It wants to survive. And what has it done? It has adapted to survive. Now, diseases caused by gene mutations. People, I'm going to give you four. We're going to go through four diseases, because I guarantee you now, every exam paper that you are given um, as a formal national type exam will have something on one of these four diseases in those question papers. All right, so nobody's expecting you to go and learn these off by heart, but know the basic causes, the basic symptoms, and the basic treatment. And in most cases, there is no treatment. It's you treating symptoms, really. So here we go. Diseases caused by gene mutations. Your Huntington's chorea, this disorder was first identified and described by George Huntington in 1872. Now, this is not something they're not going to give you a question and say, when was the disease? You follow what I mean? That is background information. It's something interesting. But clearly, Huntington figured out and he identified this disease. That's why it's named after him. All right? Um, the mutant gene is dominant. Now, this is the problem. That gene is dominant. Now, remember, dominance, if we have two dominant genes, clearly it happens. If we have a dominant gene and a recessive gene, but it's the dominant gene that gives you the illness, guess what? You are going to end up with it as well. So, it is dominant. It has an effect on the heterozygous and the homozygous states. So, um, this disease affects, please look at this, one in 10,000 people. And I mean, we think about this and we think, oh, well, you know, that's not us. It could be. And the problem here is that you only pick it up when a person's over 40. But let's look. Causes. The mutation of autosome genes, in other words, body genes, they're not your, your, your sex chromosomes. They are your autosomes, um, are located on chromosome 4. So chromosome 4 would be chromosome 1 and 2 would be a pair. Chromosome 3 and 4 would be a pair. It's chromosome 4. Symptoms um, appear at about the age of 40. Now, what normally happens after the age of 40? By 40, most people have had their children. And we've just said this is an autosome gene that is dominant. So we are going to see it in the homozygous and the heterozygous state. This is a problem. And the, as a parent, you now turn 40 and you start going mad. And I mean really mad because most parents are crazy. That's how you view your parents, I'm sure. My children view me as mad. But I mean truly crazy. And you can't do anything. And your children then know, okay, well, mom or dad are now going dilly. Um, they have Huntington's, oh my goodness, the chances that the child has Huntington's is very, very, very real. So let's look. Appears at about the age of 40, so sufferers have already produced children who have a 50% chance of carrying this gene. Life expectancy is between 10 and 15 years after onset of the symptoms with a sharp decline, and this is the problem, in mental capacity. Now, this is what makes it such a sad disease because you start to lose your mind and you actually don't know that this is what's going on. Specific symptoms. 
People, have a look here. Progressive deterioration of the brain cells. Now, guess what? If the brain cells are, or think about it, if the brain cells are deteriorating, it's going to cause brain shrinkage. Um, you've got now, I know some of you are sitting there saying, and I know if I was in a classroom, your hands would go up and say, oh, ma'am, we only use 10% of our brains. Correct. We only do use 10% of our brains. But if I stand here and I go, I don't know, um, da, 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 all right, I may be using 10% of a portion of my brain. If I'm reading, I'm using 10% of another portion of my brain. If I go and I start and I do a cycling race or I play a game of water polo or a game of hockey, I'm using a very different set of 10% of my brain. So correct, you only use 10% of your brain, but at one specific period or time. So people, you use all of your brain, but you only use 10% of it at any one time. So if you start having brain cells deteriorating and breaking down and, and just turning into nothingness, um, yeah, you're going to have brain shrinkage. You're going to have severe memory loss. You're going to have intellectual ability loss. You're going to start hallucinating. You're going to have severe mood swings because remember part of your brain and that what regulates your mood swings is your hypothalamus. And if the cells start dying around there, whoa, we have a problem here. And if people have mood swings, they sometimes become very aggressive. So you could have somebody who is completely placid and the biggest darling in the world, and they become like boxers, all right, or cage fighters. And you think, but this isn't my mom or my dad. This is a crazy person. Eventually, because of this progressive deterioration of the brain, we have eventual slurred speech because the speech centers will become affected as the brain becomes incapacitated. Incapacitated means it stops working and it stops working properly. Um, very frustrating is when a person, for example, is able to read um, and they then start to lose the ability to read, the ability to talk, the ability to hear or see or touch or taste or smell and the personality starts to change. Gradual loss of control of voluntary muscles, okay, resulting in uncontrollable shaking. Also, an inability to control the bowel and the bladder. So it becomes really sad to watch a person disintegrate. And this is over 15 years, which can be very traumatic for the family. Um, the treatment, there is, please people look at this, no treatment. So all they can do is to make this person comfortable, and they slowly but surely go, and I use this term loosely, off their minds over a 15-year period. You, they, there is no cure. So this is an awful, awful, awful disease. Now think back to genetic engineering and think back about the Human Genome Project. Here they would be able to remove that Huntington's um, courier gene from the children, which means those children would, would not... Um, from the children, remove it, and then the process is sorted. Okay, now, here's a question. And this is the kind of question you can expect in an exam. And this was, and I put you with kind thanks and acknowledgement from Data Response Exercises in Biology. This is P.W. Erst et al. and it's Shooter and Shooter 1989. Okay, let's have a look. Huntington's courier is a rare hereditary disease, I just want to get a nice bright green here, that is only noticeable in the late middle age. In other words, we've just learned the age of 40, with the first signs after the age of 30. All right, now there's a slow decline. Now it's not like you have your, 30, your 40th birthday and all of a sudden you are now a crazy person. Um, it is 30 and then slowly little things will start to happen that nobody will really take notice of until it starts to happen a little more often and a little more often. So during the course of the disease, the brain, brain tissue is damaged, causing the person to become restless, moody, and depressed. Now some people are like that all the time, with a bit of luck your parents aren't, and you will not be. But it'll, it's a change in personality. Later severe muscle spasms develop, now, please, severe muscle spasms could also be a lack of magnesium in the diet. So don't sort of think if your mom or your dad gets a severe calf cramp that, oh dear, they've got Huntington's courier. Not right. Okay, so please, it's a whole lot of symptoms together. 
um, develop in the body, the person becomes insane and then dies. And I mean insane as in the clinical term of insanity. The disease cannot be cured, very important, and there is no way of slowing down its progression. The family tree or pedigree chart of the diseases in one family are below. Since the disease can be observed from the middle ages only, all right, the age of the person is provided in brackets. A cross indicates that the person has died, all right, so, and, and at that age. The factor causing Huntington's career is very rare and is known to occur in fewer than one person in a million. Now, that's what they say here. Earlier, we said to you it's approximately 1 in 10 to 100,000 people. All right, the factor causing it, and we have assumed the person B is homologous. Now, if they're telling you that person is homozy at least ho homozygous, if they're telling you that person's homozygous, it means homozygous dominant. So if they are homozygous, let's have a look. Now, remember people, if they give you a pedigree chart in an exam, you take it as a diagram and you make notes for yourself on this diagram. So they're saying B is homozygous. If we look at the key here, this is a male with Huntington's courier. All right. In other words, this male would be, now if we're using an H, um, for Huntington's courier, he must have the dominant gene, but he has the disease, which means he must be HH. And we're saying this person here is the female who does not have the disease. She's going to be little h, little h, because they say she's homozygous. She doesn't have the disease. So if it was capital H, small h, in other words, heterozygous, then they would tell us she's homozygous and she doesn't have it, so therefore it is the two recessive genes. Now, we look at this family tree here. We have this, this girl, this female of 72, she's clear. We have this male here, doesn't have the disease. He died at 69. Now we know this disease sort of comes about at about the age 40, lasts for about 15 years, so we're looking for people dying between the age of 55 and 60. All right, here, we have a death at 14. Now, that death at 14 could have been for any reason. Um, then here, we have a death at, at 59, which is pretty much Huntington's. But they tell us the female with Huntington's. So if this female has Huntington's, she must have, be capital H, small h, or she can be capital H, capital H. We don't know. Now, at this point, but now we go back and we look at the parents. And if the parents were capital H homozygous and small h homozygous, can we have a capital H here? No, we can't. So we know now that that was not possible. All right? So this is how you work your pedigree chart, please. So we now know it definitely is that. This male here and that female there, now, at least this male here, we have to worry about this male is fine, but this male here must be capital H, capital H, or capital H, small h, to have it. But now we go back to the parents. Were there two capital H's there? No. So the fact that they weren't, it takes that option out again. So do you understand when I say to you, and when we did the genetic crosses, I said to you, work backwards. Always look and then work backwards. So here we know is capital H, small h, because there aren't two capital H's from the parents, and these were all one set of families. Okay, this person lasted to 60, great. This person here to 72, so they had a wonderful life, and we know they were without the disease. So if they were without the disease, they have to be little h's, little h's, little h's, and little h's. And this person here has to be little h. This one here, capital H, small h. So heterozygous for Huntington's. Immediately we know that their children here, that 
capital H there is going to cause a problem. Now, with every single reproductive process, we have the same chances occurring each time. So, looking here, the male with Huntington's, this male here is a product of this cross. So, therefore, he can't be homozygous, he must be heterozygous. And all of these, the fact that they are clear, they must be homozygous recessive. And we can write it for all of them. Okay, and well, let's do it for this one because it's got a number next to it. Here, we've already established this person has Huntington's. The fact that the parents were heterozygous and homozygous recessive, this child here, this offspring, can only be heterozygous. This little one is clear, therefore, and this baby here ends up being, because this baby is clear. So, if we look at the questions, they say to us, in the is the gene causing the disease dominant or recessive? Provide a reason for your answer from the family tree provided. Okay, now if we look back at this family tree, and I've got two family trees here, so we're going to have to go back each time. But if we look back at this family tree, how do we know that this disease is dominant and whether it is recessive? Apart from the fact that they told us in the question, is that if we look at a cross here, with homozygous recessive, we see that only two of the offspring ended up having the disease. All right, so the majority are free. Now, something else here. When we talked about this, I said to you, this person is, must, it has Huntington's, therefore, it is capital H, small h. But what we neglected to say is that it has to be capital H, small h, so heterozygous, why? Because if we look at these children here, how did those children come about if their option was only homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive? So it certainly isn't hetero homozygous dominant, it has to be homozygous recessive. So when we look at our answers, we say provide the gene causing, uh, uh, is the gene causing this disease dominant or recessive? Provide a reason for your answer. You would most definitely say it is dominant. But now that would be one mark. They want to know why. So you have to give it an answer. So we say um, the presence of this gene in the heterozygous state in the heterozygous state still causes the disease. Okay, now, is Huntington's chorea a sex linked disease? Provide a reason for your answer from the family tree. People, if we go back to our diagram, if we go back to the diagram here, there was absolutely no issue with it being male or whether it was female. Here we have a female who ends up with Huntington's. Here we have a male. Here we have a male. The father figure here, A, was a male. So males, females, it doesn't matter. They are going to get the disease either way. So it is not sex linked. So we would say no. And that, now look at this mark allocation. It's two and two. So no gives you one mark. And then we say both males and females are affected. Sorry, affected. Both males and females are affected. Then, although individual D did not apparently suffer from the disease, 
So we're looking at individual D. It was not known whether she carried the disease of Huntington's courier. Explain the genetic basis for this answer. Now, if we go back, individual D, if I remember correctly, is the child... D is this child that I pointed out to you died when she was 14 years old. So if she died at 14 years, people, um, we don't know what the process was. We don't know what she died of. Uh, she could have had Huntington's. She didn't necessarily have to have Huntington's. But the fact that she died when she was 14, really, we, we don't know. So what you would write here is um, she died at 14 years so this would be clearly let's put a little line there before onset of the disease okay um, she could have been a homozygous recessive she could have been anything it doesn't matter um, so this is the problem here, is that she died when she was 14, which is before the onset of the disease, which is normally between the age of 30 to 40 years of age. Because by 40, it's definitely in. So she could have been um, homozygous. recessive or she could have been heterozygous now if she was homozygous recessive she would be safe if she was heterozygous well then she's carrying that dominant gene all right so that pretty much is what you would have to write now if we look at provide the most probable genotypes for each of the following individuals a b c and e now i'm going to go back So we're looking at A, B, C, and E. A has to be heterozygous. So we'll write that down now. B has to be homozygous recessive. They tell us it is homozygous, um, or this person is homozygous. If we look at C, has, does not have Huntington's courier, and they ended up at 69 years of age, that was homozygous recessive. And if we look at E, E has the disease, they must be heterozygous. So we're going to be heterozygous, homozygous, homozygous, and heterozygous. So A is going to be heterozygous. We said that B was homozygous, C was homozygous, and E was heterozygous. A lot of learners, when they answered this question, put A, B, C, D, because they forgot that E is what was being asked. So please, if they leave letters out, um, make sure that you still look at, for the right thing. What are the probabilities? So they're asking you, what do you think? What are the probabilities that individual N, O, and P will suffer from this disease? Explain your answer. So if we go back, so people we're looking at N, O, and P. So N is only five years old, O is only four years old, and P is only eight years old. So we don't know. But if we look at the probabilities, here we have two parents. The probability is that they have produced children here they were, went to the age of 72 and 69. So the assumption is that they are homozygous recessive. They produce three children. Now, if they are homozygous recessive, look at this. If I cross H and H and H and H, what am I going to end up with? 100% Huntington's courier free. All right? So there we have it. All three of their children are fine. And their children produce... N, the chances are that baby is homozygous as well. If we look at this process here, 
where we have somebody who comes in from somewhere else. We don't know what their history is. But we, so we don't know what I's history is, but we do know J's history. And if we look at J's history, one of the offspring end up with being heterozygous. And the father, uh, sorry, the mother, the mother here has Huntington's courier. In other words, this child here could possibly end up with the disease. They're only 27 and 30, and our assumption is that they are homozygous. So we are assuming that this child here is going to be homozygous. So it is an assumption. All right, so it's in the second generation here. Here we have the third generation, um, and if we look here, Granny had Huntington's courier. So there is quite a possible chance that mom here is carrying that gene but we are going to be quite hopeful, knowing that the father figure here was homozygous recessive. And then we look at this child P here, and we say, well, there is a high probability. Why? Because M has the disease. And okay, but now we know it's in the, in the heterozygous state. We are the mother here is at 37, she seems to be fine, and she is homozygous recessive. So the probability here is high because M has the disease. So there would be a 50% chance here of this child ending up with Huntington's courier. So it could either be this combination or that, combina that combination. So we're looking at 50% chance for this, and a 50% chance for heterozygous. If we go back to O here, we're saying that, what do we have? We're looking along here and we have E, as I said to you, has Huntington's courier, which means that the spouse was homozygous, which means that J could be carrying the gene. And if J is carrying it, because J is only 27 years, if J happens to be heterozygous, the chances here again are 50% that the child will be homozygous recessive or a 50% chance that this child will be heterozygous and carry the disease. If we look, go back to N here, there is no chance because the second generation ended up being fine um, you end up, or at least this is the second generation, ended up being fine. You've got 70 years and 69 years, they were okay, which means the chances of their offspring having Huntington's is very, very, well, it's impossible because of our crosses there, and their little baby here is going to be fine. So here we've got a 50% chance of either of P and O ending up with Huntington's, and here this child is completely free. Okay, we've answered this question. If we look at question six, use the evidence in question 1.5 to explain why there are so few people known to be sufferers of Huntington's courier in generations three and four. So we're going to have to look back at that. So they want to know why there are so few that are sufferers. So. If we look at this whole process here, in fact, I'm going to take an eraser and I'm going to take everything off so that you can start and we can actually have a look at this. All right, looking at our process here, what they want to know is we're looking at our, our um, second generation, we're looking at our third generation. And looking at these ages across here, what have we got? We've got the ages of the individuals um, in generations three and in generation four. Here our little babies are tiny. They're still little kids. Only M, only M has been diagnosed at 39. But M should have known that something was, was not 100% right. Why? Because M's 
parent here, the mother. Diagnosed and passed away at 59. So M and L and K and J should go for counseling as a matter of course. Why? Because of this. And all these children here should have gone and got checked. Why? Because A clearly died at the age of 62 and was diagnosed. So none here, if we look at generation three, none of the other offspring, none of them have reached the ages where the symptoms can be recognized. We're sitting with, okay, look, 37, and that's an outside person. It's the person that was married. But if we look here, let's just take the screen. If we look here, 31 years, 29 years, 27 years, they're still young. The onset is between 35, around about 35 and 40. So, or between 32, 33 and 40. So this person, if they are going to have Huntington's, well, it'll set in in the next three or four years. So that is what you're going to write. You're going to say these individuals here, okay, of generations three and also the fourth generation, all right, are between the ages of, and I mean we can look here, the ages are between um, four and 39. There are your ages, between the ages of 4 and 39. Let's just write this here for any learners that are colorblind. Okay, they're between the ages of 4 and 39, which means only M has been diagnosed, and none of the other individuals are ready to be diagnosed yet unless they go for genetic counseling. All right. Um, so we've, we've discussed that question then. What is the likelihood of a person being homozygous for Huntington's courier? Choose from. So we're looking at a person, any person, you, me, any person. What is the chances of us being homozygous for Huntington's courier? It is extremely low. All right. And now we need to explain why. Because... If, um, I need to, so explain that answer and we say, right, it is extremely low. Why? Um, if one parent is homozygous recessive and one parent is heterozygous, okay, what is the chances of, well, th there is no chance of producing a child that is going to be homozygous dominant. So what do we do? We say, there we have. So therefore, producing a homo homozygous dominant offspring or child Offspring is the correct term to use. A homozygous dominant offspring, um, well, guess what? That is zero. You cannot because of your cross here. So we say, right, so if both parents are hetero, at least homozygous, let's make it heterozygous, heterozygous, then we are increasing the chances. Then there's a 25% chance of your homozygous dominant and a 50% chance of it being heterozygous. So we're now looking at a combined 75% chance of Huntington's courier being there. It is only when both the parents or homozygous recessive, that there is a 100% chance that this child is not going to have it. So it's extremely low. Okay, people, now we move on to our next section. We're going to look at sickle cell anemia. And people think, well, sickle cell anemia, oh, you know, hardly anybody has it. A lot of people have it, but mainly people that live within the malaria regions. Now, if you and I ended up with sickle cell anemia, we would be very, very ill indeed. 
But living in a malaria uh, um, area, like, for example, Mozambique, um, Nigeria, Tanzania, certain parts of those countries, if we got zapped with a mosquito and we ended up with malaria, we would be fine. It wouldn't affect us. So that is what sickle cell anemia does. And do you recall earlier when I said to you, sometimes we have gene mutations and the gene mutation sits there and it doesn't really have any benefit for the organism until the environmental conditions change. And then that gene ensures survival. So here we go. Sickle cell anemia um, is, a genetically, is, is genetically passed within families. Genetics compared, a, a geneticist at least, compared malaria areas with the sickle cell anemia occurrences and found the distribution matched. Okay, now how does it help? The gene is co-dominant, so that's important, and passed on at, by heterozygous and clearly homozygous parents. Okay, heterozygous carriers, now this is how we are going to determine them, were less susceptible to malaria when malaria is fatal kills to homozy um, homozygous HBA individuals. So, so we go down and we say, right. So that A, the, the A tells us they don't have sickle cell. That little S tells us they do have sickle cell. All right, heterozygous and homozygous sickle cell individuals have a selective advantage and pass the gene to their offspring. So causes, well, what do you have? We've told you it's a single mutated disease. And what does it do? It changes the hemoglobin. Now, if we look at a red blood cell, um, here, here I've explained it. With your red blood cell, it contains hemoglobin, which is HbA. But in sickle cell anemia carriers, the sufferers have HbS, which causes amino acids to swap and alter the DNA code. So how, what do we see? The symptoms the red blood cells change into a sickle shape. Now people, your red blood cell looks like this. It looks like a little donut with a thin middle end like that. From the, that's from the side, from the top they look like this with a sort of a donut dip in the middle. That's what your red blood cell looks like. And what your sickle cell anemia does is it changes your red blood cells and that's why they call it sickle cell anemia. Your red blood cells shape changes to that. So what does it do? It causes blockages in small blood vessels and that eventually causes oxygen starvation to the muscle cells. So it, when there is anemia, not enough oxygen, um, it can be carried by the red blood cells. And what happens? It results in infections, excessive tiredness. Why? The excessive tiredness is because of a lack of oxygen to the muscle cells. Why? People, you did cellular respiration. You did that in grade 10 and 11. So you've got your cellular respiration process and what does it do? It takes your cells in the mitochondria of the cells. You've got glycolysis will occur outside the mitochondria. And then your products of, of glycolysis go into the mitochondria. And you have the processes that occur there is to take the oxygen and you use that oxygen to oxidize the glucose molecule, resulting in energy, which is ATP, carbon dioxide and water. And what do we breathe out? <sighs> that air that comes out, carbon dioxide and water vapor. All right, so if we don't have enough red blood cells, the person is anemic. And if they are anemic, they are going to have excessive tiredness. Why? The muscle cells can't, let me just write your muscles can't produce enough energy. And if they can't produce enough energy, guess what? You're going to be tired. And in some cases, we end up with, and this is a problem, dilation of the heart. And if, it's, if there's dilation of the heart, that heart doesn't contract as nicely as it can, and we end up with big problems. We also end up with an enlargement of the spleen. Why? Because what is the spleen's job? 
its job is to help to break down the damaged cells. So the spleen collects them and these sickle cells collect there to be broken down and when they collect there it causes all kinds of issues. Why? Because the result is as they're on their way there they cause damage to the lungs, they cause pneumonia which is excessive fluid on the lungs. You have rheumatism, joints swell up and they get very sore. Um, damage and pain to the gut, to the kidneys, to the liver. So all of this and we end up with death. So this is what we end up with if a person has these sickle cells. Except if you're in a malaria driven area and you end up with those little amoeboids floating around in your body and they are trying to hurt you, your sickle cell sorts them out. Treatment, only symptoms are treated as malaria can never ever be cured. So what you could also do is stop the mosquitoes from biting you as, as a first priority. And then from there, if you get bitten, you're in trouble. All right, we're now going to look at hemophilia. And if we look at hemophilia, we've done a little bit of hemophilia when we did um, sexually transmitted genetic diseases. So I'm going to just brief through this. Hemophilia is hereditary breeding disorder, uh, um, bleeding disorder caused by sex-linked recessive genes. The blood cannot form a stable fibrin clot and that's what causes the bleeding. So someone with hemophilia, if they get bumped really hard, uh, they just end up with internal bleeding. Um, hemophilia affects one in 10,000 males at birth. And hemophilia, that's hemophilia A, hemophilia B, one in 50,000 males at birth. The causes, we've gone through people, it results in two possible genes, hemophilia A and B is inherited as sex-linked recessive genes. The males carry an XY chromosome where the Y chromosome has no allele okay, for blood clotting. In females, one defective gene will cause them to be carriers. The essential blood clotting factor is absent and shame. They end up with, with really big problems with regards to bleeding. Symptoms. Um, abnormal subcutaneous. Subcutaneous means below the skin. So subcutaneous bruising, uh, uh, bleeding and bruising. And just from little minor bumps and scratches, you get intermuscular bleeding. And then we also get huge swelling and poor circulation. And eventually, muscle atrophy and gangrene. And gangrene is when <clears throat> everything starts to just go bad and it rots and it infects and it becomes disgusting and the limbs have to be removed. All right, very painful. Now treatment, people, there is no cure because it is genetic. So there is no cure, only symptomatic treatment to prevent muscle atrophy and gangrene. And then what they do is they replace the person's plasma. So um, a, a person with hemophilia will go into hospital and have blood transfusions. The problem there is that many hemophiliacs ended up with HIV before blood used to be tested rigidly. Now any bit of blood that comes in is tested. Um, so, you know, we don't have to worry too much about that. I suppose the safest bet is that if you do go into hospital and you do need, do need a blood transfusion, get a family member, your mom, your dad, and get them to give you blood. That's if they are HIV negative. All right. Now let's move on. Albinism. An albino is somebody who does not have any pigmentation in their skin and their hair and their eyes. All right. They do not have pigmentation. They do not have melanin. They don't produce it. Um, there are beliefs and certain people that, that, that as I say, beliefs that um, albinos are very strange or that they are magical or that there's some strange issues where people come up with. And these are things that I've had from learners in classrooms who've said to me, albinos don't die, they just disappear. They are human beings. And they are human beings that are slightly different. So please respect other people. And if you respect other people, you will treat them with respect. All right, so let's look at albinism. Albinism affects all races across the world and it affects approximately one in 30,000 people. The mutation causes a lack of pigment called melanin, people. It's melanin um, in the skin, the hair and the eyes. Albinos are sensitive to sunlight. Why? Because they don't have the melanin. What gives us our tans 
um, is if we, we go and we, we, we lie in the sun, we get brown. That is because the melanin is produced to protect our skins from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So, you know, it, it's, that is what a person who is an albino will not have that. Okay? Um, so they are very susceptible, shame, to skin cancer. The causes, it's a single pair of recessive alleles that are present in the homozygous states. So we're looking at little a, little a, causing a lack of enzyme required to produce that melanin. Heterozygous parents are carriers and have a 25% chance of producing a, 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 a albino offspring. If you recall, way back when, when we did genetics and we did the basics of genetics, there were four crosses. And I said to you, learn those four crosses because that is basically every cross you could possibly get. If we look heterozygous, heterozygous here. Let's make A for albino. So they are heterozygous parents. They will be fine. They won't have albinism. Um, sorry, they will be fine. This offspring will be fine. And this little one here, 25% chance that it is going to have an, be an albino. All right, symptoms, the lack of melanin. So the skin is very white and pinkish. Um, dark, it should be spots. Dark spots develop when exposure to the sun. They actually look like... Um, uh, freckles. Then no natural protection, the person becomes susceptible to, to sunburn and possible skin cancer because that's what the melanin does. It is your natural protection to the sun. White hair later turns to a straw, colored, uh, straw color for maturity and the eyes generally are a very light blue. All right, and they are very photosensitive. Now look at the word photosensitive light sensitive because photo means light and you did that right in the beginning so photo means light light sensitive photosensitive treatment it's purely symptomatic so what would you advise someone who's an albino they would make sure that they cover their bodies um, with with even if it's very light fabric but cover the body with as much fabric as possible um, if you're not if they don't Use protection factor 50 if they have to, or protection factor 100, the highest protection factor they can. Put that on their bodies. Make sure that their eyes are protected with good UV sun, uh, sunglasses. Um, make sure that they wear a hat when they go out into the sun. Um, maybe look for a job or find an occupation, vocation, profession where they are within offices and not outside exposed to the sun. Okay, identifying carriers. First of all, people, we're going to look at genetic testing. Now, what does genetic testing do? It will identify a gene that is problematic, okay? Genetic testing would include, now you must know these components, and they can be quite difficult. And the reason you need to know them is so that when you do get them in an exam, you understand what they are about. So, Identification of the blood proteins. This would be one form of genetic testing. So you check at those proteins that are present in the blood. You would analyze the person's individual in, uh, uh, DNA. Each person has an individual set of DNA, and that could be analyzed. Also, checking for the chromosomes and the gene sequencing, because that identifies a human being completely. It's almost like, or it is, genetic fingerprinting. It is also important to understand the process of transfer of genes to carriers. Now this is where we are going to look at, at, at three processes. There are really only three processes of transferring genetic diseases genetically. All right, and it depends on the type of gene that causes the disease. Now people, if you understand this, I promise you now there will not be a question that will confuse you. So let's look through them. You get your autosomal dominant allele. Autosomal tells you it comes out of the 44 chromosomes or 22 pairs of chromosomes, all right, that deal with the body and not sex linked. So they are autosomal and look, dominant alleles. And an example would be your Huntington's courier. So here only 
Only one is affected uh, um, heterozygous parent. So here we go. Here you've got your gametes. Here we have the possibilities of fertilization. Or the combinations of the fertilization. And look here. Now remember it's a dominant allele. So those 50% chance that the babies will be affected. And now... That's if only one parent is heterozygous. If both parents are heterozygous, we immediately move now to 75% of the offspring will be affected. And only this little 25% here is going to be clear. And that is if it is an autosomal dominant allele. Second one. Here we get autosomal recessive allele. So autosomal, it's still part of the 44 chromosomes that are in with, with regard to your body. It's not the sex chromosomes. We have now put them aside. Okay, so autosomal dominant, we have Huntington's courier. Autosomal recessive, here we're looking at albinism and sickle cell anemia. So you must know it is an autosomal recessive gene. So here we go, or allele. Only one affected parent, so we go heterozygous and homozygous. These, this group here, this parent is going to be affected or affected. Remember, it's too recessive. They're going to have kids that are fine, but each kid is going to carry the chance of that disease being passed on. So here we have a hundred percent, capital B, small b. The kids are all offspring, the, uh, the kids are all carriers. Um, and they are both recessive genes are required, remember, for that trait to, in the genotype and in the phenotype. But if both parents are heterozygous, what do we have here? We only have a 25% chance that the, child, that, the, that the kids are going to be clear. We're going to have 50% of them are going to be carriers and 25% are going to be affected. Straight little uh, a Punnett square calculation. If we look at our sex-linked recessive alleles, here we're looking at hemophilia, we're looking at color blindness, there are a whole number of diseases. Here, what we've done is we've put a little T there, and the little T indicates whatever the, the, the trait is. So this would apply for hemophilia, it would apply for color blindness. Um, that's the mom, she's the carrier. The dad, well, he's, he produces his sperm XY. So this is what we end up with. So there we have a female who will become a carrier, and we have a male who's going to end up with the disease. So if we look here again, we have a female who is clear. She doesn't carry it. We have 25% of the female are going to be carriers. 25% of the males are going to be clear, and 25 sham are going to be affected. So... If we sit now and we have a look at, um, we have the mother is clear. There are her possibilities. The father is infected with it. So when they have children or offspring, we end up with two females that are a 50% chance of females being carriers. And we end up with a 50% chance that those males are going to be clear. Just to recap, people, so we get autosomal dominant genes like Huntington's, or autosomal recessive like, for example, sickle cell anemia or albinism. And then we also have sex linked, and we've done sex linked twice now. We did it in the previous section of work, and we are, have done it here. Color blindness is caused by a sex linked chromosome, which we've just done, and generally the males are affected. So we spoke earlier quite flippantly about the fact that, or in the previous lesson, about the fact that it's generally males that are colorblind. But I have to add there that it's generally males that make the most amazing fashion designers. So there you go. And also very, very creative chefs. Um, I'm sure they're the 75% they're that aren't affected by colorblindness. A person who's colorblind has difficulty with the perceptions of greens and, and reds, and in severe cases, they are unable to distinguish between these colors at all. Alrighty, now, 
We're running out of time, and I'm trying to get through as much work as I can. Question two. This is taken from the National Senior Certificate Examination Paper 1. These will all be from Paper 1 because it's the first two modules of work, and it's the Exemplar 2008, and it's question 1.5. So this is about a disease called cystic, cystic fibrosis. Now, this is not specifically in your syllabus, but it is a genetic disease. So the, the examiners are quite capable of giving you a question like this because what it does is it applies the concepts that you are supposed to know with regard to genetic diseases. So they throw something at you and you think, cystic fibrosis, I've never heard of this. Or walla walla woodoo disease or whatever the case is. You just turn around and say, okay, I do know that it can either be autosomal dominant genetic diseases or they can be autosomal recessive or they can be sexually transmitted okay and if they are se transmitted by those sex chromosomes you know the basics you know that in the homozygous state XYZ in the heterozygous state XYZ in the homozygous recessive state XYZ you know your facts you can apply them Right, let's look. Cystic fibrosis is an inherited disorder of the human body caused by, now look what I'm doing, recessive genes, okay, or a recessive gene. This disorder affects um, mucus production, causing a blockage of the tiny air passages in the lungs. So clearly that person cannot breathe properly. Study the pedigree chart diagrams below and answer the questions that follow. People, in a genetics question, in an examination, if you are given a pedigree chart, you say, yes, bring it on. Because with a pedigree chart, you have a picture of exactly what's happened. And if you have that, you just fill in your information and you move on to your questions. Because what they've actually done is they've given you clues for everything you need to know here. So let's play. And it is, let's play. Family one and we have family two. Now, if we look at family one and let's clearly look at what it is they are going to be giving us. They say here, remember we're talking about cystic fibrosis. This is a normal male. So this male is normal. And uh, look at this. That is a female that is normal. And they're telling us here by showing us that. Therefore, what does it tell you? That this disease is recessive and it's homozygous recessive and only if it is homozygous recessive will it come through in the children so they all show, also show you here that if it is a shaded block or circle that that is the affected child now we're not dealing here people with Huntington's courier where you are only going to pick it up when the person is between 35 and 40 years of age all right so you, the, the, you don't have to wait till the person's 40 to start seeing that they're going uh, uh, and they're losing their minds and their brain isn't working so well anymore. All right, here, you're actually going to pick it up. So, they show you. Little Tandy, Shan. Now, we've got Tandy and we've got Sipo, we've got Sam, we've got mother, father, mother, father. So, Tandy, poor little thing, is affected with cystic fibrosis, which means she must be, it is recessive. She's going to be little g, little g, okay? And she's the only one that they didn't give us. Oh, they didn't give us the mother here. But now look here. This mother is going to produce a child that is little g, little g. We know that the father is capital G, small g. We know that this child here is capital G, small g. So what can the mother be? Well, the mother cannot be little g, little g. Because if she was little g, little g, she would be infected. She would have it. So we know that isn't correct. What is the only other alternative the mother can be is capital G, small b. She must be heterozygous because otherwise where does this child come from? She can't be homozygous recessive. She can't be homozygous dominant because this little g, little g has to come from somewhere. So we are working backwards each time. So let's look at these questions. Name the genotype presented by 1 and 3 in the diagrams, respectively. Okay, people, 
Let's have a look at 1 and 3. So 1 is this mother. We know that the mother is capital G, small g. And they said 3 and 3 here is going to be, now Gugu is coming from parents that are heterozygous, therefore Gugu, and she is not infected. So we know for sure she is, um, note, that she is not, definitely, not going to be small g, small g. Otherwise she would be shaded. So therefore she has to be heterozygous. So they said one and three, we're going to have heterozygous and heterozygous. The genotypes, um, capital G, small g, and ca uh, capital G, small g, that's for one, and that's for three. And you've got your two marks. What is Tundi's genotype? Now, people, there's Tundi. Shame. And what is Tundi? She shaded. They've given it to you here. That is a bonus mark, and there is no excuse for not getting that mark. So Tundi is going to be little g, little g. In other words, she is homozygous recessive. Does Tundi suffer from cystic fibrosis? They told you at the beginning of the question that if a person is, has the two recessive genes, they carry the disease. So therefore, they suffer from the disease. So does she suffer from cystic fibrosis? Most definitely a big fat yes. Tundi and Sipo intend getting married. Show using a pedigree diagram and the key above all the possible genotypes of any sons they might have. So let's just get, we know Tundis, let's get Sipos. So we're going to say Tundi and Sipo, these two are going to get married. So he's heterozygous. So we have to do crosses for heterozygous and homozygous. So let's do our cross here. We're going to use the same key, so it was a circle for Tundi, and we can write her name here, okay, and Sipo, he was a male and he was heterozygous, and the two of them are going to have children, um, I think the best way to do it is like this, and put or here because their child can either look like this or their child can look like this. And we're going to say they have sons. We're looking at boys only. We're going to have our combinations. So on this side of your paper or on wherever you want to do your rough notes, do this. And we have... So... I would say here they're either going to be capital G, small g, so heterozygous, or they're going to be little g, little g, and then shade this in. I can't color this in because then you won't see it, but let's shade it. All right, and the mommy one here, Tundi, is shaded. And for this diagram, they are going to be giving you four marks. So one, two, three, four. Okay, then explain what Tundi and Sipo should consider. So we, now we go to genetic counseling. Before deciding whether to have children or not. So they must decide what to do before they have children or not. So what we can say here is that they need to understand, because it's what must they consider. They must understand um, that there is a 50% chance that um, the child or son will be normal and there is a 50% chance that child will have cystic fibrosis. All right, that, that's the most important thing. Secondly, I would suggest in an answer like this, you can say that they need to go to 
genetic screening or counseling. They need to go for genetic screening. They need to go for genetic con. I never know how to spell counseling. I always battle with this word. But counseling. And then you know what people, at the end of the day, they need to take responsibility for their choice. And once they've taken, a respo taken responsibility for their choice, they can recognize what the issues are and the symptoms are, and then they can address them. But people must make a decision based on an educated decision, an educated viewpoints. You can't just say, no, that's it, because you, aren't, you don't stand in those people's feet. You know, my gran used to say many years ago, walk in another man's shoes, just for one day and you will know what happens and how, why that man is the way he is. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would apply to men and women. So don't ever judge people if they have issues, if they make decisions to abort or not to abort. And in this case, it would be an abortion because it would not be spontaneous, it wouldn't be a miscarriage. It's their decision and respect that. I think if we have a world based on respect, everything would be great. Now, as for you, have an awesome, awesome week. Go work hard. Go make a difference. And put all your stuff together. Go through it and know how to apply your knowledge. Because knowing it and not being able to apply it is useless. Have a good one. Until I see you next time, cheers.